Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, uh, good evening uh, to the Lohan webinar. Today we are very happy to have uh, Professor uh, Duffy as our speaker. Professor Duffy is one of the leading financial economists in the world, and uh, he's an Adams Distinguished Professor of Management and Professor of Finance at Stanford GSB. He's also a fellow and a member of Council of the Econometric Society a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a research uh, fellow of MER. Uh, moreover, he's a distinguished fellow of Lohan Academy, uh, who hosted today's webinar. Uh, in 2009, Professor Duffy was uh, elected to the president of AFA, and uh, he's also deeply involved in uh, major policy design, such as the reform of labor, euro, uh, Euribor and uh, actively in many uh, policy discussions, as we will see today. Besides uh, academic papers, Professor Duffy also uh, read a lot of general books in finance, such as uh, How Big Banks Fail, Marrying Corporate Default Risk, and uh, Dark Markets, uh, and maybe next book on digital currency. Um, as to today's topic, on, uh, on May 25th, I remember in the fifth uh, Frontier Dialogue hosted by Lohan Academy, uh, Professor Duffy already uh, gave a quite impressive and a little bit controversial, I would say, a, a discussion on CBDC at the time. Uh, it has been five months over, and uh, today is our honor to have Professor Duffy to share with us about his thought on the introduction of CBDC. Um, without further ado, Professor Duffy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ingju. Uh, it's terrific to be here. I'm glad you you uh, noticed that I uh, my remarks in May were somewhat controversial. I think they are uh, somewhat against the grain of a lot of thinking on this problem, and I want to explain in more detail today. And first of all, let me uh, thank everybody at the at the Luohan Academy for inviting me, and it's such a pleasure to be part of this academy and to learn so much from uh, your your meetings. Uh, so uh, today I, I want to talk uh, at a very high level, uh, not about the details of what CBDC can do, how it's built, but rather how central banks and um, more generally governments are grappling with the decision about whether to have one or not. And in my view, some of the misunderstandings about the motives for doing this and the and also some of the misunderstandings about the disadvantages <clears throat> of doing CBDC. So without, without much uh, delay, I'm gonna jump right into some slides. I'd like to keep this conversational, so please interrupt whenever you like. And I hope to leave plenty of time at the end for a good, a good healthy, robust discussion of the policy issues. So if you're seeing my slides, you're seeing the prototypical uh, Alice and Bob, they're always Alice and Bob in a discussion of digital payments. And Alice is at the bakery, she has to pay Bob eight dollars. Uh, $8 is a lot for a loaf of bread, but uh, here in Palo Alto, things are pretty expensive. And Alice has to figure out how to pay. <clears throat> and the whole discussion is around how she's going to make <clears throat> the $8 payment. She could make it in paper money, but uh, the vast majority of payments in uh, and most economies today are not made with paper money, they're made electronically. And in the United States, by far the most common method of payment is to uh, use a electronic uh, message to your bank and to tell the bank to move the $8 out of Alice's account through the payment rails, which can be very complicated. And eventually the $8 will show up in Bob's account at his bank. And uh, Usually Bob will get a message right away saying the money is coming, although the money doesn't get there for a day or two or possibly three. Uh, business to business payments are made the same way. Often the message is still done in the US by a paper check actually for businesses, very common. Uh, but credit cards are very popular. Debit cards are somewhat popular. Direct uh, bank transfers are a bit more popular in Europe. They're almost not used uh, for general purpose payments. Uh, in the US, but they are used somewhat. And, and as everybody in here knows, we're here to talk about other ways to do this that are coming into the economy, ways like 
uh, using a fintech payment service uh, like WeChat Pay or Alipay, or using uh, stablecoin, or using a central bank digital currency. Technically, I guess you could say that WeChat Pay and Alipay are also bank railed now because they have to be made through, or at least the money has to be stored at a bank. But uh, I, I consider that uh, a fintech entrant into the bank rail payment system. And that's important for reasons I'll discuss. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the bank payment rails are reasonably complicated. I'm not going to try to give you a, a summary of how it all happens. There's for, for card payments, there's several cryptographic token steps that have to happen. And a lot of messages going back and forth, a lot of actors taking money out of the payments. Uh, banks take about 80% of the credit card interchange fees. Credit card companies get about 20%. There's various other fees involved. Uh, banks use uh, usually uh, some form of central bank or netting against central bank uh, deposit accounts. Uh, and eventually the money gets from, from Alice who might be, let's say customer one, uh, down to Bob, which might be customer seven of his bank, possibly by uh, a route like this one. It's not working very well. It's been going for centuries, actually, since uh, the time around 1607 in the, uh, uh, at the Bank of Venice, uh, the idea that you can make a payment by debiting your own bank account and crediting the account of your payee's bank uh, has been around for centuries, and it still uh, uh, accounts for the vast majority of payments globally. Um, but that the days of that may be changing. Well, let's see. Uh, there is a lot of disruption coming. Let me uh, unpack this slide, which is based on data in McKinsey's latest global payments report. Uh, the stack is the various components of payment revenues going to financial services firms. The left stack is for North America. That's as fine as they break it down. They have components for various other regions like EMEA, uh, which is a very broad region and Africa and other areas. But let me just do North America and rest of world. <clears throat> you can see North America, the total payment stack is about $485 billion of revenues a year. That's very substantial. It's about 2.1% of GDP. And many people don't realize uh, that consumers and businesses are paying about 2.1% of GDP to have their payments made. Now that's not a deadweight cost. A lot of that is profit margin. And you can tell, for example, by looking at the bottom segment for North America, North America is very consumer heavy relative to the rest of the world in terms of payment revenues. And in the consumer sector, it's extremely heavy on the card or credit card component. And that's because interchange fees are very high in North America. They're over 2.2%. <clears throat> I'm going to come back to this, but it's, uh, it's a, a high profit margin uh, industrial organization that's extremely hard to enter. <clears throat> the reason it's, it's, it's hard for firms to enter and compete down these very high profit margins is that we have a classic Rocher to roll two-sided market situation. Let me unpack that a little bit. Rocher and Tirol explained that in a question. No? Somebody just yeah. Yeah. Okay, we got that one. Okay, so uh, as Roche and Tirol explained, uh, let's let's talk about the consumers. They're getting a good deal here. The the people when you go into your uh, coffee shop and you whip out your credit card and and tap it, it seems great for you. It's just one tap. It's as easy as making any other kind of fintech payment, and uh, doesn't look like it's costing you anything. And you might get reward miles uh, for your, air, if your airplane rides or, or bonus points or cash back. So you think it's great. Uh, the merchant, however, is suffering a big cost. So why doesn't the merchant uh, use some other payment service and not have to pay such a big fee? Well, because when you go in and you want to pay for your coffee, you want to use your credit card and the merchant 
doesn't want to lose your business, so they take whatever you have. Uh, there's a network effect as well. Since everybody is using these cards, everybody wants to use them. Uh, and so uh, you get this network effect that's very hard to break into, two-sided markets with lots of network externalities. And as a result, you get um, oligopolies with extremely high profit markups and uh, the rest of the world less so because in some countries like in, in, the, in Europe, uh, interchange fees are regulated down. Now, the, that's not to say the rest of the payment stack is unimportant. Business to business payments are also very expensive. Uh, the commercial part in the US is less, but it's still, remember the stack in the US is bigger than the stack for the rest of the world. It's 2.1% in the US, much less in the rest of the world. So uh, the United States should be the first place at which regulation and uh, possibly a central bank digital currency would come in uh, in order to encourage uh, more competition and more innovation, faster, cheaper, more efficient payments. But it's not happening yet. And that's why we're here today to talk about this. So one, one possibility, as I mentioned, is uh, to introduce a central bank digital currency. This is a schematic meant to simplify the problem, but as everybody knows, Alice is probably gonna get a payment app and, uh, and buy her digital currency through her payment service provider, PSPA. And once she has that app, uh, she can tap the app at the coffee shop and a message will go via her app to the central bank. The bank will remove $8 from her account and put it into Bob's account. It's real-time gross settlement, so Bob will get the money right away, and he'll get a message saying he just got the money from his payment service provider. And then, of course, he can pay for his pay his vendors and everybody else if he wishes by central bank digital currency. So, what's not to like? It's cheap. It's fast. There's no credit risk of any kind. No counterparty risk. Uh, if the if it's well designed, the payment service providers can provide efficient apps. And you don't have to have the central bank doing that. Uh, the central banks are not are not like uh, unlike uh, our host today. The central banks are not noted software developers. And I noticed that in China, which has a version of this, uh, Alipay is one of the software components of the ECNY system, which runs pretty much like this. Although in China, it's uh, there's multiple places at which the ledgers are kept and where the wallets are kept. And it's not clear in other countries how that's going to happen. Now, as almost everybody here knows, uh, there's been a huge amount of activity in the central banking community in researching and developing uh, central bank digital currencies. It seems like almost every day there's a new announcement. Today, just today alone, uh, and it's a typical day, there was a new story about um, one of the governors of the Central Bank of Switzerland, the Swiss National Bank, saying that they could probably be ready by January to go live with a central bank digital currency in Switzerland. That's not to say they will, but it's pretty much developed. Also today, the a paper from the Monetary Authority of Singapore came out with ex actually a very excellent discussion of costs and benefits, not, however, tipping their hand about whether they're going to do this. As everyone knows, Sweden uh, the European Central Bank uh, and uh, many other central banks are in the course of developing CBDCs and China is pretty much ready. About 10% of people in China have used a wallet to hold ECNY, although it's not clear to me yet uh, how much they, uh, people in China will actually prefer to use CBDC. Uh, that remains to be seen. Just put, going aside to China for the moment, I didn't put it in my slides because it's somewhat controversial, but the motives for ECNY in China are mixed. Uh, I think initially China wanted to do this to make sure that it didn't get too much invaded by uh, undesired cryptocurrencies. And the Bank of Canada has set aside the same reason for developing a CBDC. Uh, the, the People's Bank of China is also concerned I think uh, that the fintech payment services, Alipay and WeChat Pay, are, have such a large market share, over 90% in urban areas, uh, that they are, have become too dominant. And you can, you can interpret that two different ways. Uh, Wu Chongchun, the, uh, spokes, the chief spokesperson and head of the 
Digital Currency Institute of the People's Bank of China has said, we don't we want to have an operational backup. You, you don't want to be reliant on one or two fintech payment services. But another another interpretation of not being too reliant is that the central bank and the government of China more generally would rather control this space. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of commerce. It's not common in China for the central government to prefer a situation in which private firms control this much data uh, that affects the lives of everyone. Uh, that's my that's my uh, controversy for the for this morning. I want to move on, however, and talk about policy generally speaking around the world and not just in China. But I hope we'll get some engagement later on the on the situation in China. I'm working on a big report with 25 experts uh, interpreting what China is doing with ECNY and what the United States should do with its own payment system. So let's go to the Bank of England. I think the Bank of England, while it's not yet developing a CBDC, has some of the most thoughtful and forward thinking work on the problem. And I would add to that, by the way, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, whose report came out today, I do recommend it. But anyway, the Bank of England has given seven simple reasons for wanting to have a CBDC, supporting resilient payments, uh, avoiding the risks of new forms of private money creation. We're going to talk about stable coins in a minute. Supporting competition, efficiency, and innovation in payments. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, one of the main reasons to do this is to create competition for bank payment services, which in my view uh, have not been subjected to sufficient competition. And if nothing else works, nothing else meaning regulation or fintech payments, then CBDC is your last remaining option. And that's the way that I think about it. Just to let the cat out of the bag, I'm speaking pretty quickly today because I want to get all my key points in before the discussion gets too thick. My, just to let the cat out of the bag, my view is that a country like the United States should immediately begin developing this technology, not delay. This is a multi-year development project. It's taken China six years to get ECNY up. The United States is a even more deliberative uh, government apparatus and requires buy-in from many different constituents. And the technology is far from simple. Uh, never mind what some may tell you, uh, balancing the protection of privacy with the ability to detect illegal payments is a big lift, not to mention how to reach consumers efficiently. Uh, it's not simply the movement of uh, electrons on a ledger. Uh, there's a lot involved in this in terms of policy and implementation. And the research work that's going on at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston is just a very basic research. So the United States should begin developing immediately so that perhaps in five years, it will have the technology if it needs to use it. But it's not at all clear, and that's the point I wanna make over and over again today. It's not at all clear that this is the best route to improving payments. It's the, it's the nuclear option, if you like. If you can't get regulation to force more competition into the banking system through entry by FinTech firms or open banking, then this is your remaining option and it should be made ready. In a smaller economy, not the United States, but a small open economy, there's a completely unrelated reason to get busy on this immediately. And that's the fact that you could be subjected to dollarization or yuanization, whether by a foreign CBDC or by a foreign stablecoin, uh, more likely by a foreign stablecoin. And you want to get people using your own digital currency before uh, someone else's digital currency invades your monetary sovereignty. That's one of the key reasons that's given in the Monetary Authority of Singapore report that came out today. Again, which I highly recommend. Going down the list, uh, we've, we've touched on... Uh, the first three, meeting future payment needs uh, either a CBDC or a private sector fintech solution will be needed in the future digital economy for doing things like programmable money, smart contracts, uh, uh, and many other applications that, in, that involve tokenizing money. Improving the availability and usability of central bank money. What does that mean? Well, for me, it meant uh, going along with number six, that the last time I went to Stockholm, 
uh, for a conference, I brought my old paper money, several hundred uh, kroner of banknotes. And I said, this is great. I'm going to use up this old paper money. Uh, and my hotel wouldn't accept it. They said, we don't take paper money anymore. Uh, here in Sweden, nobody uses paper money. So I had to come back home with my hundreds of kroner in notes. Uh, and the decline in cash affects the availability and usability of central bank money. And so another reason to do this is if you're a central bank and you really think that your citizens should have access to an official form of money, then this is your chance uh, if you don't introduce a CBDC or ceding the space to the private sector. Now, I don't think of that as economics very much. Uh, I think the private sector can do a pretty good job if it's, uh, if it's competing properly to provide private money. That's the way things used to be in most countries. It's not, uh, it's not impossible as, as long as you regulate private money so that it's safe and interoperable. Uh, but um, if you really believe that consumers should have access to official money, then this is the time uh, to begin working on that before paper money goes out of circulation. And then finally, which I won't have time to talk very much about today, cross-border payments. There's a different way to do cross-border payments with CBDCs that cut out enormous costs and delays. And it's a whole use case in and of itself. It doesn't necessarily require a general purpose retail CBDC to do the cross-border payment but it might be convenient uh, to have an interface between a domestic retail CBDC and a cross-border payment CBDC. And uh, the M bridge that's, been, that's being worked on at the Bank for International Settlement hubs uh, around the world uh, is a very good example of how that may develop. And the last uh, report that came out two weeks ago on the, from the Bank of Thailand on the, on the hub uh, that connects Thailand, Hong Kong, China and the UAE is an excellent list of use cases with private sector market participants uh, giving relatively detailed descriptions of how they envision using uh, Embridge for cross-border payments in various applications. That's about as much as I'm gonna say about cross-border unless we come back into that. What I wanna talk about are some of the other costs and benefits that are not on the Bank of England's list. I was a bit surprised uh, that the Bank of England did not put financial inclusion on its list. Now, one interpretation is that uh, the United Kingdom already has very good financial inclusion, and that's not a motive for adding a CBDC. Another interpretation is that it's far from clear that a CBDC has a big impact on financial inclusion. It's, uh, it's one of the major reasons that's being put forward in many countries, and I think it has some potential for doing that, but none of the proponents of CBDC for financial inclusion have really explained why that will work or how it will work. There's a, a sort of vague, vague indications or promises that if everybody can have access to a CBDC, then the fact that they don't have bank accounts will be less important, um, but no one has explained yet how it is that everyone gets a CBDC access or wallet is it, is, it, uh, is it that they're going to sign up for a CBDC with the Fed? Probably not. Are they gonna to go to a bank? Probably. If they're gonna to go to a bank for CBDC, why wouldn't they get a bank account at a CBD, uh, 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 instead of a CBDC account? Now, maybe, maybe they're more reluctant to give up their private information to a bank. I would say in the United States, most of the um, 5 million households that do not have bank accounts are more afraid of a government uh, regulated uh, information system than a bank regulated information system. So I don't think that's it. It could be that bank services are very expensive and that's a good reason to regulate bank accounts so that they're very cheap. It's not a necessarily a good reason to introduce a CBDC in and of itself. Now, some countries are making great progress on financial inclusion without necessarily invoking CBDC. And I would put India at the top of the list uh, with RDAR and UPI. They've done an amazing job at increasing financial inclusion simply by requiring that all banks provide free bank accounts to everyone uh, and then making it very easy to move money uh, using RDAR. And that's become extremely popular in the last two years. 
So is CBDC a method for increasing financial inclusion? Possibly, um, but I, I've yet to see it explained well why it will make a big difference. And so even though I'm a proponent of developing CBDC, uh, this so far, this is not the strongest argument for doing it unless and until someone explains how it's done. <clears throat> now, let's go to some of the other fintech possibilities beyond CBDC. One of them is private stable coins. And I'm sure everybody here knows uh, how this works, but just let me remind you. Alice goes to her stable coin issuer. It could be uh, in the US circle, which issues USDC and says, here's $500 from my bank account. Uh, I want 500 of those stable coins. They're each worth a dollar. The issuer gives Alice 500 tokens and takes her $500 and invests it in a trust which holds high quality liquid assets. Uh, those high quality liquid assets in principle would be nice if they were federal reserve deposits in the United States. So then there would be really, really strong protections for Alice that the assets backing her coins are, are good. So far, the United States uh, has not gone this way. Uh, there are no narrow banks issuing uh, private stable coins backed by Federal Reserve deposits. There are some uh, stable coin issuers that are backing their coins with other types of assets, which are not as good. The Fed is reluctant to provide these narrow banking uh, accounts to fintech uh, issuers of stable coins, whether they're a new bank or anybody else. However, recently the Treasury Department issued a report. Last week, in fact, it was announced at Stanford University by Treasury Undersecretary Nelly Leon. Uh, this report explains that the approach in the United States that's recommended by the Treasury and by the other, all of the agencies, all of the US regulators, is that these stablecoin issuers must be banks. Now, it doesn't say exactly what kinds of banks, and it doesn't say how the stablecoins must be backed and in what form and whether the assets are segregated or, they're, or whether they're insured or anything else. Uh, that's, that announcement has been a big positive uh, in, some, in the view of some because it makes clear what you must do in order to issue a stablecoin and removes a lot of uncertainty for entrepreneurs. And by others, it's been heavily criticized saying, what, what do you mean? This is just entrenching banks even further um, because now only banks can issue these. So it, it, we don't know yet what's going to happen, whether this will require legislation or whether uh, anything is coming, but uh, private stable coins uh, are a fintech alternative for making payments. So far, they've only been used in the crypto space as a medium of exchange for cryptocurrencies almost exclusively, but there's no reason in principle they couldn't be used in the broader economy for Alice to buy her, her loaf of bread at the bakery. And uh, that might be, if again, if we can't get banks to compete, that might be an opportunity uh, to force them to compete harder if you had stablecoin competition. Yet another approach is a fast payment system. Uh, the key defining pro properties, this is a bank, railed, a bank railed payment system. It's 24 seven, 365 availability, as opposed to today where you can't move money in a bank railed system unless the banks are open, which is during the day. It gives you re near real-time access to the funds by, by Bob the baker. He gets his money immediately without any credit risk. And it's real-time gross settlement. Uh, so there's settlement finality. Everything is good. Uh, the United States has already experimented with this in the private sector with a system called RTP or real-time payments. But not that surprising to me since RTP is controlled by a consortium of banks it hasn't really made much of a difference in terms of the efficiency of the US payment system. It's not very broad spread. Hardly anybody knows about it. There are no easy apps on your phone by which you can swish your money around on RTP. Uh, and the profit margins in the payment space have kept pretty much where they were high. The Fed therefore has decided it's gonna introduce its own real-time payment system called FedNow coming out in two years. The unfortunate thing is that so far, the Federal Reserve seems to be ceding the distribution and application space to the commercial banks, saying here, here is our technology. 
RT, uh, FedNow, go ahead, banks, you may now deploy this technology as you see fit to your customers. Now, if I was uh, Bank of America or Chase, there's no way that I'm going to tell my customers, we would really love you to use this uh, FedNow payment and take away our profit margins on cards and other payment services. It's just not going to happen. Uh, and so I'm not expecting FedNow to make a big difference unless it's coupled with regulation that requires a significant amount of interoperability across the applications provided by uh, the banks with FedNow and that there are additional uh, safeguards for competition. So I have a very strong opinion on that one too. Uh, we can come back to that. Here are some examples of fast payment systems that are already in place. Korea, Bank of Mexico have been doing this for decades. China does have a fast payment system, but it also, of course, has WeChat Pay and Alipay, which essentially does the same thing. Sweden has been out in front. The United Kingdom is getting going on this. Singapore is doing really well on fast payments. And the European has a target instant payment settlement system, which is called TIPS, which is coming into play. The United States, I already described the situation. Brazil is thinking of using its fast payment system as, uh, which has been very successful. Uh, it's called, it's called uh, hmm, forgotten the name of the Brazilian, PIX. Uh, the Brazilian fast payment system could be the basis for a CBDC and Brazil is considering that because instead of giving a fast payment accounts only to merchants or banks, you could give a fast payment account to everybody. Uh, that's a possibility. That's a cheap, cheap and easy way to get a CBDC is just take your fast payment system like FedNow and just give everybody an account. Now, let me get to what I think of as the most interesting economics of all of this. Uh, but before that, let me pause uh, because I'm just getting to the heart of the story. And I've been talking at high speed. I've not left a single gap, airtime gap uh, for anybody to interject, disagree, comment before I get to the really interesting part, which is what happens to banks when you do this. Okay, I don't see any hands up, so I'm gonna get into the real heart of the matter. <clears throat> if you, uh, Rodney. Yeah, no, I thought if you'd like, it's always nice to get questions, I think, during. <laughs> Good, I like so if, if I was to give one question, which maybe, uh, Maybe it would be better at the end, but but if you think about, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times the idea of CBDC as, as competition to banks, you know, in, particularly with regard to bank payment services. Uh, would the credible threat of a CBDC be, be enough? So what if the CBDC, what if the central bank was poised and ready uh, to produce? Do we actually need to produce it or is a credible threat enough? I, I wrote exactly what you just said into my Senate testimony to the Senate Banking Committee this summer. I said, uh, as long as the Fed is not developing a CBDC, the banks will not feel any particular need to move aggressively on improving the efficiency and cost of payments. But if the Fed begins a full-scale development project, which would be my wish, my wish, then the banks are going to say, gosh, we better get going here because they're going to take our space. Uh, they're going to drive, up, drive down our profit margins, as I'll explain in a minute and we'll lose uh, touch with our customers, so let's get moving. And I think you're right, the threat of it would be enough to make a big difference. The other way to do it is simply regulate competition, but I think the way that the United States is wired in terms of regulation, it's gonna be harder to do, uh, to regulate it, but simply having a CBDC development project may do the trick. The other, the other threat point is to introduce stable coins, saying, if you don't do it, we'll let the stable coins in. That's a bit trickier because it's a harder, a harder thing to control. Any other questions before I move to the impact on bank funding costs and what about credit provision? Okay, I'm gonna take a new whack at this. I've tried maybe five different ways to explain why I think some central bankers have the wrong idea about the impact on credit provision. And I'm gonna make this real simple. I'm gonna oversimplify, in fact. I don't believe 100% of what I'm saying. I believe it 95% and I'll explain the other 5% in a minute. Okay, so here's the story uh, that you get told 
both by the Bank Policy Institute, not so surprisingly, and by some central bankers uh, like Vice Chair Quarles, who's a strong critic of, of CBDC, and like uh, some papers at the BIS, uh, uh, which have suggested that when you introduce a CBDC, credit provision may be adversely impacted. Okay, so here's the story. You have this bank that's intermediating. It has two sources of funds. Again, I'm oversimplifying. It's getting general purpose deposits and it's widely conceded, and we have a few experts in the room here today, that deposit funding is way below market. If you look at the numbers on the bottom of this slide, I'm just giving you an example from the last time that US interest rates were not near zero, April, 2019, the wholesale rate was 240 basis points. So wholesale funding was, you know, was what it was. It's the market right market rate, 240 basis points. But banks could get a lot of their funding from from much cheaper sources, from their depositors. And the weighted average deposit rates, as you can see on the bottom of this page, in basis points, were 10 for savings, six basis points for interest checking, 19 basis points for money market. Uh, that's small. That's small size CDs, certificates of deposits and 29 basis points for jumbo money markets. That's large CDs over $100,000. Those are the weighted average across the entire United States banking system using FDIC data. They're posted on their website. You can go find these data. Now, when I talk to some, uh, some people, they say, no, uh, this banks are very competitive on the deposit side. They're, they're, you know, there's thousands of banks, surely they're competing with each other. But if you look at the numbers and if you, have common sense, you know they're not competing because there are high switching costs for consumers to move their money from one bank to another. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but <laughs> I've tried it. It's not easy to move your money from a deposit account in one bank to a deposit account in another bank. So the idea that consumers are always switching around their deposits to get the highest interest rate is simply false. Uh, and uh, consumers are sleepy as well. They just, they're not paying attention. When the Fed, when I went to my bank, the last time the Fed did increase rates, I said, ha, the Fed increased rates 25 basis points. And facetiously, because I knew that what they were going to say, I said, how about increasing my deposit account by 25 basis points? And the manager at the bank looked at me and he said, well, we talked about it and we decided we're not going to do that. What does that mean? It means banks basically have the market power. They can decide whether they're going to offer that higher rates or not, they do eventually compete a little bit, but not very much. So banks are getting really low funding, low cost funding from depositors. And whatever additional funding they need, they get out of wholesale markets. And so I put up some fake numbers that are kind of representative of numbers at a particular point uh, in the interest rate cycle. And uh, so I'm assuming, for example, that deposits are funding at 50 basis points and wholesale funding is 100 basis points higher at one and a half percent. So this is a sweet deal for banks. They're basically getting uh, a profit. They have a profitable deposit franchise and uh, low competition for those deposits. Now, if a CBDC came along or a stable coin or a neo bank, a narrow fintech payment bank, the banks would say, uh-oh, uh, consumers are starting to move their money to these faster, more efficient, cheaper payment services or businesses are. Uh, so we'll have to raise our deposit rates or alternatively, they'll leave their deposit rates low uh, and let some of the deposits migrate uh, into CBDC or other uh, payment media. Uh, and that's, I mean, I, I agree that that's going to happen. Everybody agrees that that will happen to some extent. There's not, there's hardly a paper that says, uh, including research papers, there's a great paper, for example, by Chiu, C-H-I-U, and Devil does, Devil Dahusian. Uh, do you know how to say his name, Rodney, at the Bank of Canada? No, okay. It doesn't matter. I don't know how to say his name properly, but uh, they, they have a paper. Everybody, all the research papers agree that if you have a CBDC or there's FinTech competition for banks, that banks will either lose deposits or have to pay up uh, higher rates for deposits and their average funding costs will go up. So that's total on, totally on agreement 
what's on disagreement is on the right-hand side. What's the impact on credit provision? Now, let me tell you, in my view, this is the main policy concern at the Federal Reserve. All of the speeches that you've read had this explicit or implicit, and my conversations uh, with the insiders tell me that the biggest concern is that if you make banks compete and pay higher deposit interest rates or go to more wholesale funding, credit provision will suffer because if your funding costs go up, you have to pass that on to your borrowers. Now, I simply don't see why that's necessarily so. I'm not saying empirically it might not happen, but the arguments that are made that borrowing costs, corporate or other borrowing costs will go up are simply not well-founded. And the logic is really simple if you look at it. Uh, this, in this diagram, the bank is providing loans to borrowers at let's say 1.6%. And these arguments that credit provision will suffer would therefore have you believe that were it not for the cheap funding, those borrowers, uh, some of them would not be getting credit. Some of them would not get loans. Now, who is it of those borrowers that are getting loans that are not that uh, that would not get loans? Uh, that the the banks don't have to provide loss loans. They're not required to lend to borrowers and lose money. They can simply take the funding that they're getting, whatever the funding, and invest it in the bond market. There's no need for them to take a loss on a corporate loan. It's not as though Rodney over at uh, the uh, Bank of Santa Barbara is gonna say, you know what? I'm getting such cheap funding on the deposit side. I should really take a loss on my corporate lending to be nice to those corporate borrowers. Uh, and I'm gonna take losses because I can cover it with my profits on my deposit franchise. Rodney's not gonna say that, that's crazy. Uh, he's gonna say, I'm only making loans that are profitable compared to the alternative, which is to go into the securities market and lend, uh, for example, and buy bonds. So why would it be uh, that Rodney would stop lending to borrowers that he's already found to be profitable relative to bonds? All that's gonna happen is that Rodney's profit margin is gonna go down. If his deposit funding costs go up, his profit margins are gonna go down, banks are gonna have lower return on equity, and it's gonna be bad news for bank shareholders but I have yet to see the argument for why corporate borrowing will suffer. Doesn't make sense. There's no economics, no economic argument that makes sense. There's also a recent research paper by Wen Shin Du and collaborators that showed that in money market reform, when banks lost a trillion dollars of low cost funding that they were getting from the tri-party repo market, corporate borrowing, a trillion dollars of low cost funding went away. Corporate borrowers, did not lower their credit provision. Uh, pardon me, uh, banks did not lower their corporate lending, didn't suffer it at all, not significantly. Okay, so this, this main argument against CBDC strikes me as totally unfounded. A very, a very strong views on this. Now, I told you that's 95% right. Let me give you the 5% that I think where there's an, an actual argument that corporate borrowing may suffer and that's small community banks in outlying rural areas. And this could happen in any country. Suppose, for example, that Rodney's Bank is in the middle of Nebraska, which as for those of you that don't know, is a very rural state and the middle of it must be in the middle of almost nowhere. I don't even know the name of the town in the middle of Nebraska. And uh, Rodney is getting this cheap, these cheap uh, deposit funding and he has to cover his Overhead, he's a small bank. Overhead is quite a lot for a bank. Has to run, you know, bricks and mortar and paying the manager and all that stuff. So somewhere or other, he has to cover his overhead. And all of a sudden, along comes the CBDC or stable coins, and everybody in Nebraska says, Oh, I'm not shopping with Rodney anymore for my deposits. I can make my deposits into CBDC. Rodney's funding costs go up. Rodney can no longer cover his overhead because that's his only, his real profit margins are coming on that side. And uh, if you can't cover your overhead, you go out of business. The corporate borrowers in the little town in the middle of Nebraska are then gonna say, whoa, this is bad. My bank's gone away. I have to go to the big city to get funding. They don't even know me there. 
And uh, so my cost of borrowing is going to go up. That's possible. So, and it's also politically quite potent uh, because community banks, there's thousands of them, they're dispersed all over the country, uh, and no nobody in Washington D.C. will ever want to mess around with credit provision by community banks in small outlying regions. Now, it's a very small fraction of total credit provision, and maybe the borrowers will get along okay by borrowing from bigger banks. At this point, I would not want to be a shareholder in a small rural bank in the United States. If it's not going to be CBDC, it's going to be some other fintech or information technology change that's going to make it very hard. Uh, there's been some legislation in the U.S. to try to cover their uh, cover their losses. One of them is called the Durbin Amendment, but we won't have a time time to talk about that today. Okay, that was my big issue. Now I'm going to move on to cleanup. Yao Zhang, what uh, uh, what do you have? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think this is super interesting, Daryl, and I, I'm fully with you on the uh, lending side. If it could go back to the founding side, I wonder oh, yeah. maybe one alternative would be um, banks and they simply um, rely more on, for example, equity funding or maybe issuing long-term bonds. And that might be a good thing, right? Because um, we know that a huge cost for Deposit funding is deposit insurance, and that's actually a huge social cost. So I'm not sure how do you think about that potentially switch for banks in terms of their funding structures. Yeah, well, uh, you know, the pecking order uh, for funding is always to get debt funding over equity funding. So you're going to go to debt markets first. And you're right that if you lose deposit funding or it becomes very expensive, then you'll go into wholesale markets, some of it short term. And by regulation, some of it must be long-term. So your cost of funds will go up. It'll still be cheaper than equity funding. And you're right, some of that will be long-term bonds uh, and banks will have stable funding, but more expensive funding and they won't like it. It's not, a good, it's not good news for bank shareholders. It's bad news. So I feel sorry for them, uh, but uh, not so sorry that I would change my policy recommendation to go ahead and give the banks lots of competition on the deposit side. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about another possible criticism of CBDC, uh, which is Alice is gonna get her CBDC and her maybe her payment app as well from her payment service provider, which could be a bank. And Bob is gonna get his from his payment service provider. The, so far, there's nothing uh, guaranteeing how this is going to go in terms of, well, maybe Bank of America likes to have a payment app that features all Bank of America stuff and has software designed by Bank of America that is supposed to meet certain interoperability standards. But nothing guarantees that when Alice walks into Bob's shop and Bob uh, uh, does his banking at Chase, that their payment service apps are going to actually interoperate. Uh, so if you have what's called a hybrid CBDC, which is the most likely approach in most countries, including China, you really need to make sure that these payment apps are either identical or the standards for interoperability are extremely high. Uh, and again, uh, if banks are the payment service providers, they don't have the greatest incentives to make sure that their payment apps all interoperate. They like to have walled gardens. They want Rodney, uh, to shop at the same bank at which he does his other uh, financial services. They don't want him moving over to the other banks. Uh, China is, uh, China is a similar situation. Uh, there's also been some attempts uh, uh, by China's regulators to get firms like Ant, Ant Group uh, not to combine uh, their apps into a super app. Uh, if I was, uh, I'll just, I'm not giving a policy recommendation here, but if I was a consumer in China, I would love to use the Ant Group uh, financial services app because then I can do everything. I can do my payments. I can do my stock investing. I can do my insurance. I can do all of my financial services on one app. It all has the same look and feel. Very few thumb or, uh, thumb or finger manipulations are necessary to do all my things on my iPhone. Uh, and uh, if I was Ant Group, I would want to keep it that way. 
I wouldn't want to make it terribly easy uh, for my payment app to interoperate with uh, some other firm's uh, investment app. That would not be in my in my best interest as a shareholder of of Ant Group. And for that reason, uh, competition authorities around the world try to make sure that uh, firms like Microsoft and Google and other firms in the tech space don't uh, make it difficult for their customers uh, to go outside of their app environment to use apps from other providers. Uh, and the same thing could happen in the CBDC space unless there's a strong safeguard against that because the incentives are running against, not in favor of interoperability. I'm getting towards the end. I'm gonna skip cross-border payments. As I told you, if Alice, is, if Alice is in Thailand and Bob is in uh, China, then what you really want is to avoid the very complicated, expensive cross-border correspondent banking and have Alice have a simple way to send money to Bob, maybe through the MCBDC bridge, which is a way, which is a place where CBDCs uh, for Thailand and China uh, interact. This is a corridor, a payment corridor that bypasses a lot of correspondent banking. Now, exactly how this is gonna work is not clear yet. Uh, but again, I recommend the recent paper from the Bank of Thailand that explains progress. Let me finish, uh, this is my last slide before we enter a discussion. Let me finish with the main policy options. <clears throat> so first, uh, use regulations and fast payment infrastructure to promote a more open and competitive bank rail payment system. I think you do this, you should, uh, countries should be doing this regardless of whether they're going to introduce a CBDC. This is kind of an obvious policy recommendation. Another thing you could do is to allow or encourage compliant stablecoins subject to interoperability standards. And the, the treasury report that came out uh, the beginning of last week uh, basically says that. Although it doesn't, uh, it's, there's different people will have different views on whether the recommendations in that report are the way to go. I think most people uh, would suggest allowing or encouraging private stable coins as long as they're compliant. A third option is to let fintech neobanks enter the bank rail payment system. Now, some of those neobanks could be stable coin issuers. Some of them could be simply competing with banks to make payment services on, bank rail, on the bank rails. Uh, not using necessarily stable coins. Uh, my view is that the Fed should move along. The Fed is currently considering whether fintech neobanks should get accounts at the Fed. If they don't get accounts at the Fed, then, uh, then they can't really compete uh, because it's too difficult to set up a whole new network of payments if you're not plugged into the bank payment rails. As I mentioned, I think the, the nuclear option, the last one, but the one that should begin development immediately, is to develop a, a general purpose central bank digital currency. To have that technology, let's say it takes five years to do it, you wouldn't wanna wait five or six years from now and then say, oh my gosh, everybody else in the world is now using this. We're losing uh, competition globally. The US dollar maybe uh, is starting to lose its edge in international markets and our consumers are getting a bad deal. Let's start doing this. That happens six years from now and then it's another five years until it's ready, that's more than a decade, that may happen. Uh, right now, the United States is not really leaning hard into a CBDC. Uh, so I recommend the safeguard, which is what Canada is doing, what the ECB is doing, which is develop it now and decide later, once you've got it working, whether to deploy it. Uh, I think that's the wise choice you don't even yet understand what are the costs and benefits and whether the technology is able to protect privacy and allow monitoring of illegal payments effectively, let alone other uh, resi uh, operational resilience issues like cybersecurity. So you need to get going on the technology. And then finally, I think it's very likely the world is going towards 
uh, cross-border payment corridors that bypass correspondent banking. And so having special purpose CBDCs for settlement systems and cross-border payments in development seems like a pretty good idea too. Uh, so that's that's the end of my uh, remarks, Idrin. And so uh, I leave it to you to what we should do next. Let me take yeah, down I'll, my, my I'll, slide. Yeah, let's go open to question. I think you can also leave the slides there if- uh, Leave them on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can ask uh, ask one. Uh, I have a question regarding to the intro uh, intro temporability. Uh, so, uh, if you can go back to that slides about uh, the yeah the previous one, the previous so, one, this yeah. this one. Uh, yes. Uh, for me, I think it's more like a technological issue. Uh, because uh, you already said uh. Uh, first, you already uh, praise what on group has done. Actually, I'm doing all the business uh, in the same app, even by insurance for my cats hunt there. And uh, it's uh, quite convenient. And also I have actually have CDBC inside the app. I think uh, for China's case, they already maintain this uh, standard for every app, including the app from some banks and uh, are, uh, still is in a, uh, experiment stage, but uh, I think it's more like a technological. If the central bank consider this as an infrastructure and uh, if it's possible uh, in terms of technology, what's the economic downside of this CBDC? I think they, they have an argument, although I'm not completely agree, saying that uh, so those big fintech firms, uh, say on group already have a very a large competitive advantage due to its uh, more efficient, convenient uh, uh, services, but they don't want to this com competitive advantage turn into a more like a market power or even a monopoly power. So by uh, ensure that every app has same standard, they want to kind of promote or uh, encourage bank to increase their service. So yeah. That's my question regarding. Okay, so that's a great question. And I agree with you that uh, this can be done technologically by requiring standards so that even if you're using, you know, one company's super app, that the CBDC part of it is completely easy to interoperate with some other super apps, uh, CBDC, like let's say WeChat and, uh, and uh, Alipay. Uh, so it works in China. But remember the situation in China is a little bit different. The apps are being designed uh, with a top-down approach. They're being provided to consumers through banks, which are largely state-owned. Everybody in China is pulling in the same direction because the state is pushing them to pull in the same direction. Uh, the United States is a different environment. It's very difficult to get the banks to line up and do the government's work for it. And so over time, I'd be interested in the views of those present. Uh, it wouldn't be surprising to me to find out that when I open my Bank of America app, that the CBDC button requires one or two extra taps uh, if I wanna do something outside of Bank of America, then it takes if I wanna do something inside Bank of America. That would be the way that America works, uh, frankly. It's all based on profit and everybody gets to do their own thing until somebody comes along and says, no, 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 uh, you're putting in extra finger taps or steps to go through or approvals to move outside your bank, a CBDC uh, payment uh, relative to moving inside the bank. We don't let you do that. In America, that can happen, but it takes a while to get around to it. In Europe, the, comp the competition authorities are very rigorous. Uh, what's, what's antitrust uh, in Europe is a much lower threshold than in America. In America, you have to basically show that there's a, uh, effectively different banks are working together to reduce competition or that you're exploiting your market power in a very, very... Uh, uh, aggressive way. And, and then these things, and, and the government doesn't have the final say, like in China, it goes into the courts. 
And then the lawyers and experts from both sides, you know, maybe Rodney will be uh, the, uh, the consultant uh, expert testifier for uh, the government, and I'll be the expert testifier for Bank of America, and we'll pull out all of our research, and we'll argue and argue and argue, and then the court will sort of split down the middle, and the interoperability will be a bit better than it otherwise would be. You know, it's America is a different kind of place. Uh, so I wouldn't guarantee that if you have a hybrid system in the U.S., that interoperability is going to happen unless the government really leans hard from the beginning on the design uh, for interoperability. Sorry, that's such a long answer. Uh, Rodney, you're, I think you're next. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, Joel. Thanks. I, I, yeah, I'd like to come back to to your point about whether or not a, a CBD, an interest bearing CBDC, would reduce bank lending. Because I really do think that's a that's a really important point that that I think people are somewhat divided on. And I guess I just really sort of have a comment, which which is that you mentioned thinking about this from the perspective of of, of the supply side, from the bank's point of view of, of offering loans and how you know, the fact that the CBDC interest may increase their cost. But we can also, this is just, I guess, a comment that we, we can also think about this from the demand side as well. And so, you know, one of the things that CBDC, an interest bearing CBDC would do, it would, it would, it would impact deposit rates, as you say, but that's going to impact where depositors go. And if we think about heterogeneous banks, because you mentioned the idea of community banks, um, then this, then, then, as you know, uh, a paper with a paper with Hao Zheng, we 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 show that 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 the large banks increase their rates more in response to the increase in the CBDC rate, so they attract more depositors, but they have better ability to offer loans, and so that actually causes causes loans to increase. So just as you say, the overall effect is is very ambiguous. But I just wanted to bring in this this idea that that, that the effects are coming not only from the from the supply side, but also from the demand side. Yeah, uh, that's a really good point uh, in your paper with Haoshan, which by the way, for those of you present are, is being presented to this morning uh, or this afternoon in Europe. Is that right, uh, Rodney? Yeah, yeah, sometime like right around now. <laughs> Sorry, you're missing it. Yeah. And uh, Rod will present that paper maybe later in Lohan Wagner. He already sent us the request. Yeah. So one other point that I would make, uh, Rodney, is that my uh, my prediction is that if you have a really good CBDC, the better it is, the less it needs to pay any interest for the effect to happen. Even if it pays zero interest, the increased mobility of money, the ability to swish your money programmably wherever you want it to go easily uh, is going to make banks have to pay more for deposits because switching costs will go down. And everybody will start to say, oh, I love my CBDC. Everybody's using it. I don't need to have all this money in my deposit account. Uh, I'm going to keep a stash of it in my CBDC account, even if it's paying zero interest. And moreover, if my bank starts to pay low interest when the Fed raises its rates, I have a programmable function on my app that just moves the money into a money market fund or to a bank that pays a higher interest rate uh, am I using my super app. So uh, I think that in uh, China, uh, Ant Group had what's called Yubao, Yubao uh, for basically swishing your money into interest-bearing accounts. Uh, and I think, uh, do you still have that at Ant Group? Yes, yes. Yeah, I think it's the world's largest money market fund. So I think even if you have zero interest CBDC, if it's a really good one, you're going to get this same effect. And I, I agree with you that large banks... Uh, due to efficiency and sort of general equilibrium concerns, may actually increase pre uh, credit provision. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, it's it's the whole menu of design characteristics of CBDC that's going to determine their adoption and their impact on on deposit markets and lending markets. Absolutely. Uh, uh, there are several hands up. Maybe Luigi. So how will how are you? Uh, first of all, I love your talk and I agree with most of it. Let me raise two issues uh, just for the sake of debate. The first one is uh, you said that uh, this, uh, the funding should not impact because basically it's the margin and not the average. However, if I am a small bank in Nebraska, when I land to a builder in Nebraska, chances are that uh, its money is redeposited in my Nebraska bank. 
and at a zero deposit rate. So in lending, <coughs> I should factor in the, the fact that I generate my own funding at a zero rate, and uh, that doesn't happen when there is a CB CBDC, so that might impact uh, the lending. Second point that I know you know, but I'm surprised you do didn't mention, is if you introduce a CBDC in a world where there are also banks, uh, there are likely bank runs. So how do you prevent this from happening? Okay, so let's do the first one first. <clears throat> so there is a synergy between deposit taking and lending. Uh, and it's often emphasized uh, by bankers and Monica Piazzesi and Martin Schneider have a good paper showing that it's very effective for banks to be able to provide credit lines and so that when a corporate customer draws on credit, they just put it into that bank and the same deposits. And that gives the bank an advantage, a synergistic advantage. And the criticism that I have heard about CBDC is that, well, you don't want a CBDC to uh, take away the synergy because when people pull their money out of banks, uh, they then, banks are not able to exploit the synergy. You have a deadweight loss associated with this uh, loss of synergy. My argument is the opposite, uh, which is if banks and banks do have this synergy, it gives them a competitive advantage against entrants that allows them to continue to provide loans at lower interest rates than would be provided by other providers of loans. So the entry of a CBDC does not take away that advantage. It, it makes it even easier for the banks to compete against entrants. And if the entrants are able to nevertheless take away funding from the banks, despite the bank synergy, that means either the banks are exploiting their profit margin or the synergy uh, is, not, is not as strong is not strong enough to overcome the efficiency advantages of competition. Uh, so while I, I grant the premise of, of what you're saying, Luigi, I don't think it amounts to a reason to avoid introducing a CBDC. On, on the second point, there has been a lot of discussion about the fact that if a bank gets into trouble, then people could swish money out of their bank account very quickly using a CBDC app, take it into a safe place. I'm of mixed views about whether that's actually important. Let's just review uh, what happened in the financial crisis of 2008. Banks, some banks did experience runs, not so much, but some. And where did the money go? It went into other banks. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't go into treasury bills or something else. Maybe that was because it was convenient. For the banks that did lose uh, deposits, there are two types. The banks that were insolvent, and the banks that were solvent, but not liquid. Uh, and the Fed is able to help the latter category with lending of last resort. If CBDC leads to a bank run, then the, the Fed will save the solvent banks and let the insolvent banks go. And that's a service that's provided by bank runs. Bank runs are not necessarily all negative. Some aspects of bank runs are a positive. It's also the case that the greater the success of the CBDC in reducing bank deposits, the less deposits are left to run, the more the banks are reliant on long-term wholesale funding, which is more stable because it involves less maturity transformation. You might ask, well, why wouldn't banks do short-term wholesale funding and be even more subject to runs because wholesale uh, lenders are even more apt to run than depositors? Well, the reason that that won't happen is that the Fed has changed the regulations requiring that banks do not have very much short-term funding relative to long-term funding. Uh, they allow banks to have a lot of deposit funding because it's quite sticky. But uh, as the banks become more reliant on wholesale funding, it has to be termed out to longer and longer maturities, which means they're less and less subject to a run. The other, the other mitigant uh, of the whole issue of bank runs is okay, we have a CBDC, but it's only for retail purposes. Nobody can store more than, let's say, 
uh, $100,000 in their uh, CBDC app, a wallet. And uh, as has been shown by Josh Younger at JP Morgan, if you only allow retail CBDC of a capped amount, there's not enough deposits of that type to really cause much damage in a run. Uh, so that's uh, that's all the arguments I can find, but I do agree that it'll be easier to have a bank run and that you, you one needs to manage that. Luigi, you usually come back quick. I'm, I'm worried now you're not coming back at me. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't know that I can uh, continue <laughs> going back and forth. Uh, no, I think that uh, on the second point, uh, uh, I agree. I think that uh, there is a, a risk of instability, though. Um, I uh, would like to know your opinion on, on the Chicago plan by Henry Simons to have like more narrow bank, because once you go down that path, I think that that's, that's the natural outcome. On the on the synergy, I think that uh, if I understood correctly, you're mixing two things. So I wasn't clear in because there is a, a informational advantage, which uh, I think actually can go the other way around these days. Because uh, if I ever see a CBDC, a central bank running all the transactions, they have all the information and they can give the information to whoever I want that information to be transferred. And so there's more competition in vending, and that's actually I see that as a net benefit of a uh, central bank digital currency versus uh, a system of open banking where you force people to uh, transfer the information. But you know, when you force people, they use all the tricks that you describe not to, uh, to make it happen. So I think in that sense, it's a net positive. What I was saying is, uh, and I will look at this paper by Monica Piazzesi, but uh, what I was saying is that uh, there is a natural lower cost because you internalize uh, the fact that uh, some of the deposits are, are going back. So in that sense, it is cheaper for this bank uh, to lend. It is more efficient because you internalize this cost. So by internalizing an externality, uh, you, uh, you are making lending cheaper, which uh, uh, is going to have more lending, especially in more, in more communities, and so an argument against the CBDC. Yeah, uh, just quickly repeat what I said, which is I agree with the advantage, and which means that the banks should have a head start on competitors and they won't need to be protected from a CBDC because anybody that's providing a CBDC instead of a bank deposit is gonna to have to say, well, we can't offer you these synergies. So you probably don't wanna use our CBDC. You probably wanna stay with your bank. But if you do wanna come with us and use the CBDC, it must be because you're not getting enough of the synergies. That is, the market should work, and it, should, it shouldn't be that you need to protect the bank in order to maintain the synergy. The synergy is already a source, as you say, of internalized protection. But anyway, I think we can pick that up another time if, if we're not converging on it. So may I ask a question? I'm not sure who's speaking, but anybody is free to ask, I'm sure. Uh, yes, so, um, yeah, because uh, Zoom is kind of unstable on my iPad. Uh, uh -huh. This is Sylvia Xiang from Peking University. I in fact, you. I'm also, yeah, I'm also researching on CBDC in the, in the past, like uh, two or three years, I've been focused on this. So I think it's very interesting about the, regarding the question on the impact, uh, on the impact of uh, issuing a CBDC on the bank funding cost. So, so I, I, on one hand, I agree with you that um, it may have some, for example, some substitution effect on bank deposit, right? Once everyone is allowed to have, a, for example, an independent directly CBDC account. Um, however, on the other hand side, I think that it may also depend on the design, the designs of uh, the CBDC. For example, uh, you also mentioned China's DCEP, right? Because it has been uh, running this pilot project uh, in very intensively in the past two years. Um, and also, it also reveals uh, the main design. For example, the, the main feature of China's DCP is that it, it will be operated through a two-tier system, right? So the first tier is central bank and second tier the commercial bank. I think that the, the main purpose of this, 
uh, design is to is kind of to avoid the financial the possible financial disintermediation from issuing CBDC. Yeah. So so in fact, I have a, I have a paper with my with my author uh, May Jong from University of Melbourne. We just finished this year. It's sort of using the uh, using the, the feature main features of China's DCP to to build a model to study the impact. On, on, you know, on commercial bank. And our results show that it really depends on the de designs. So for example, based on the feature of China's uh, DCP, we think that it's made more possible that CBDC and bank deposit can be a uh, complements instead of, you know, not always, you know, subst substitutes. So then based on that spirit, we, we get the results show that it may not necessarily, you know, cause any negative impact on, you know, on the on the, uh, on, the on commercial banks, and it may have positive impact. Of course, it may depend on some the, uh, some policy parameter. But but yeah, in general, we can sort of get that type of results. Yeah, so that's you know that's the part one. That's that's why for this part, I um um yeah, I'm curious to to ask you that. What what do you think? Yeah, for this part. Yeah. <laughs> well, I agree with you uh, that with China's hybrid approach and likely with the hybrid approach that would be adopted in the United States, that banks can combine their services in CBDCs with other services like payments, like lending and borrowing. You can lend and borrow CBDCs too, uh, because after all, it's just another form of money. This is an option for banks to make more money. You can also uh, provide one-stop shopping at your bank. Now, one must be careful. Uh, I agree that this is good for this may be good for banks in terms of uh, the, the synergies uh, related, in fact, to the synergies that Luigi was just asking about. But then one must be careful because the more synergistic it is, the more you want to build uh, what uh, is sometimes called a walled garden around it, saying, ah, if you, sh if you go to ICBC, we provide all of these services and you don't need to go anywhere else for your financial services. Uh, mm -hmm. If you do that, then you raise the walls uh, for movement and free competition across the whole financial system. And that may give the bank the ability to extract rents, uh, which is exactly what the CBDC, well, not exactly, but one of the reasons that the CBDC would be brought in in the first place is to force banks to compete against each other and to lower their walls uh, so I, I, I agree, and it is a social benefit that you described, Sylvia, but uh, it also raises the potential for creating market power that could become uh, inefficient, in my view. Yeah, I think that for, um, for, the, for, the, uh, for example, for the, you know, to bring more competition to the, to the commercial banks part, I definitely agree. I think that even in our uh, models, I think that implicitly, so the, the condition that people are willing to, for example, to convert a uh, CBDC into a bank deposit is because commercial bank have to offer a higher deposit rate. Yeah, so for that part, I think that we are at the same page. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Boris, uh, I, I saw you yeah. uh, raise hand the long Quite well. Yes, I mean, my question related to what Luigi raised, uh, which is about the informational synergy between deposit taking and, and lending. And I guess I just wanted to hear Darrell's view on what would be the optimal access to information generated by the CBDC. Uh, because there is some privacy concern, but in the same time, you also want to foster lending, and that might be a very powerful leverage to foster lending. And so I just wanted to hear uh, his thoughts on that. Yeah, so uh, I haven't thought a lot about that, Boris, but uh, I, the consumer should own the data and be able to have the ability to sell the data. But uh, I'm not sure what that implies in terms of what uh, industrial organization, what's the equilibrium degree to which there's a market for that information. It, the default the default should be that the central bank does not have the ability to share the information. Everybody wants to know that their data are kept private. So it's kind of like the, the tension in Europe between PSD2 and GPDR, uh, GDPR that, uh, you know, in on the one hand, you want to market for information so that the consumer can 
take advantage of it and vendors can, can pro provide competition based on data access. And on the other hand, you want to protect privacy and these two types of incentives sometimes run against each other. Uh, I, I don't know in the case of CBDC, but I do know that in America, I'm not Canadian myself, but in America, a very large fraction of the population is extremely suspicious of large centralized databases of private information. And uh, just today, Robinhood, you know, lost another 6 million identifications out of its account. But if the government had, let's say, 300 million CBDC accounts with everyone's private uh, details, plus all their payment information, uh, Americans would generally not want to have that happen unless there were extremely, extremely tough safeguards. It wouldn't be the case like with Google, when you sign on and they ask, do you approve? And then there's a 12 page fine print set of screens that you scroll through quickly because you don't want to read it all and say, I accept uh, and giving up all of your information. Uh, I don't think that would be a sufficient safeguard for a CBDC, even if you did hit a I accept button. Uh, I don't think you want to uh, you want to play around. So the the threshold for giving up information should be, in my view, for a centralized database for CBDC, extremely high. I don't know, I, but I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I'd be interested in your view. Do you have a view on it? I mean, it, it feels a bit of a missed opportunity if we cannot share such valuable information that would allow for an efficient allocation of capital. I, I guess I'm a bit more on that side to start with, uh, but I agree with you that the worst, uh, uh, the worst thing for many people is a large data set and the Fed interacted together. I mean, it's like people's nightmare uh, in terms of suspicion. Uh, so, so the, the political aspect here is, is going to be first order, absolutely. Yeah, well, I think you have your hand up. Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Dara. This is super interesting. Uh, I think one thing you didn't talk too much about that I want to build up on is uh, the international aspects of that. Because uh, we all know that there is some debate about how, um, I mean, how should we think about foreigners hold, holding CBDC, like whether we would allow Chinese people to hold um, CBDC issued by the US um, Fed or the other way around. And especially, I think uh, there's some debate about uh, the role of um, US dollars, right, as the um, reserve currency and it's heavily used international trade. So I would love to hear your thoughts about, I mean, this dynamics going forward. Yeah, I've been speaking to U.S. policymakers about this issue. It's a really interesting one. <clears throat> so first, uh, I don't think that large central banks like the People's Bank of China or the Federal Reserve or the ECB are going to give foreigners accounts for CBDC except for special purpose cross-border payment applications. So the idea that U.S. dollar CBDC or ECNY would circulate in foreign countries for general purpose payments is not going to happen very easily. Uh, uh, China, PB, uh, the PPOC has already said we're not going to do that. Uh, Mu Chang Twin has made it very clear. Uh, uh, Zhou Xiaochuan has said the same thing, that they're not into yuanization of other countries. And then you might say, well, uh, maybe they will change their mind once it becomes convenient and everybody wants internationalization of the renminbi, so why not? But there's a lot of problems there. Uh, and I think, first of all, you have to be responsible uh, for the legality of payments wherever your uh, payments are being made. And that's hard to enforce when, the, when you have foreign citizens that are holding payment apps. And secondly, you, you have to be concerned about all kinds of issues related to privacy. So my guess is that uh, People's Bank of China will stick to its word that the Fed, if it introduces a digital dollar, will not allow any, anything other than special purpose financial services firms abroad to have CBDC accounts. Uh, there could be one or two rogue countries that will say, well, uh, let everybody use our one. Uh, we have a nice CBDC and that will help us uh, with seniorage. Uh, that could happen, but I don't think responsible central banks will do it. Now, that raises a really interesting question. What about stable coins? 
So in uh, Shanghai Free Trade Zone, there's a company issuing soon what's called CNHC, which is a CNH denominated stablecoin. In other words, renminbi stablecoins, specifically for cross-border payments internationally by business to business. So what does that mean? It means that there could be digital currency circulating offshore outside of China internationally in renminbi in the form of stable coins. And uh, that would serve many purposes in terms of internationalization of the renminbi and giving China more influence relative to the US dollar. And then the United States government will have a difficult decision to make. The United States can say, well, uh, we don't want US dollar stable coins polluting the waters of other monetary uh, systems. Uh, we will restrict any US dollar stablecoin issuer from doing that. It may be hard to do. Tether is already an international US dollar stablecoin. It's not domestically available, or at least not supposed to be. Uh, and maybe USDC would be a great competitor for CNHC in a proxy competition for commercial advantage internationally to shore up uh, the ability of the US dollar to compete against China in regions where CNHC is circulating or some other stable coin. So you could end up with the situation where CBDCs only circulate domestically, but uh, stable coins are used internationally uh, and become a kind of a different way uh, to make international payments and to increase the, the dominance of your currency. Uh, that, that is a really interesting question, a policy issue and an interesting economics issue. There is a lot of money to be made. If you just look at CNHC, for example, China deposit interest rates are, I think they're around three and a half percent now, something like that. Three and a half percent, let's suppose it gets as big as uh, 500 billion renminbi, multiply that by three and a half percent. That's a lot of seniorage, uh, very low cost. And I expect it's going to be a compliant stable coin. My, my private sources tell me that the People's Bank of China might be okay with that stable coin. Uh, that would be great for China and for CNHC issuers. They'd make a lot of money. Uh, I don't know how, uh, how the United States government would feel about that. Probably not that probably not all that happy about it. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a really good question that you're asking. Yeah, we have a related question from chat box. I'd like to read it out, but slight, from a slightly different view. What's your view on MCBDC? I think it refers to multiple CBDC and stable coins and public chain based uh, cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum on the long term value proposition and viability of SWIFT. So, wow, that is a lot. <laughs> okay, so uh, SWIFT is trying to uh, update its technology. I think it'll be around uh, for a long time, but the M M CBDC bridges that are being built, there are several uh, under construction, have the promise of being quite uh, competitive with uh, correspondent banking. It's not clear whether they'll use SWIFT for messaging or they'll use their own special purpose messaging. Uh, my guess is, uh, that China would prefer to use special purpose messaging uh, or CIPS, which is the China Interbank Payment System, which is an alternative to SWIFT. The reason that China doesn't really like SWIFT that much is that it enables uh, countries like the United States to impose sanctions on uh, firms in China and China's legislation against foreign sanctions is extremely aggressive and suggests to me that China has an extremely strong preference to avoid uh, the ability of other countries to impose sanctions. So I think policy suggests avoiding SWIFT and from, from the viewpoint of China's participation in cross-border payments. But SWIFT is, uh, is currently very strong. MCBDC is, in my view, a very promising potential technology. I think, it, I mean, you have to think of cross-border payments as the worst of the worst in terms of payment inefficiency and MCBDC bridges have some promise uh, to cut, cut a lot of the costs and time delays. So I, I'm quite uh, positive on that. With respect to Bitcoin, no idea. It's a speculative 
investment has a small amount of payment services, much of which are legitimate and proper, and some of which are illegitimate and criminal. Uh, it's difficult to see. You know, I know China has banned the use of Bitcoin. And I think other countries may lean very hard against using Bitcoin for making payments. But right now, it's at an all-time high in terms of value. So as a speculative investment, for those that bought it when it was cheap, it's been wonderful. Uh, I wouldn't buy it myself, but that's just me. Okay, maybe due to the time, our last question to James Xu. Okay, thank you very much. This is James from the SUSS uh, from Singapore. So uh, uh, thank you, Prof. Dara. And uh, actually, I just want to, I just like uh, uh, listen to your, you know, I mean, your speech about the CBDC. So I just want, uh, I'm thinking about from a gaming, from a gaming model. So actually, there are a lot of things which is even without the CBC, uh, CBDC uh, was introduced into the in the market. Actually, this kind of gaming is still existing, right? So I am wondering. So what the so what's the change from the introducing of the CBDC into the game into the gaming between the central bank and the commercial bank and also the commercial bank to the customer or no matter it's retail or the wholesale. So what is the big change you know I mean, brought from the introducing of the CBTC to the input of the game of the game model. So and also I want to know so whether the especially the MCBTC uh, they will bring any uh, big change to the for uh, to the foreign currency transaction market. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay, well, I'll give a shot at that. But um, uh, I think on your gaming question, you mean well, like along the lines of the conversation that Rodney and I had earlier. Does the introduction by a government of a CBDC cause banks to rethink their strategy for? how they offer payment services and how they price them. And I think it does. So from a viewpoint of the government, it makes sense to develop a CBDC. It's a good game strategy. And from the viewpoint of the banks, frankly, unfortunately, it makes sense not to do much until and unless you're confident you're going to get threatened, but in the meantime, to get ready. And some banks are probably getting ready right now. I would pick JP Morgan which has a huge technology budget and is well aware of the uh, potential costs of not acting. And other banks uh, may be sleepier and not uh, aware of the risks that they're going to get disintermediated by either a CBDC or a FinTech uh, payment service that could come along in the future. So I guess the, the, those are the main strategic issues. Uh, on the foreign exchange market, I think the MCBDC bridge, well, the foreign exchange market is already reasonably efficient in the interbank sense. It's only for bank customers that the profit margins are fairly high. And I don't think that's going to change very much necessarily. It might. Uh, the, the MCBDC bridge includes a corridor where there could be competition for foreign exchange. So that if your company wants to buy B from Singapore using Singapore dollars. Uh, in the corridor, they could set up an auction market and banks participating in the corridor like ICBC and Standard Chartered could compete uh, to provide by providing quotes for the exchange from Singapore dollars into B, And that could improve competition. But so far, it's too early to say how they're going to set up that market. That's one possibility that's been discussed. Uh, but the foreign exchange market in the interbank sense is already fairly competitive. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me conclude. Thank you, uh, Professor Duffy, for this uh, simple but deep uh, uh, analysis on this issue. Uh, at least for me, it clear my so I don't feel uh, controversial anymore about your uh, argument in May. Uh, uh, and also I'd like you to share with us both your 95% thought and the other 5% and give us a complete view. 
And uh, again, it reminds me about the value of academic thinking on this uh, very challenging and urgent issue that we face in the digital era. Thank you, Professor Tapi. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. It's been a real pleasure to be here today and fantastic questions from everybody. Really appreciated the opportunity to help me understand uh, how everybody else is thinking about this. So thank you. Thanks to Lohan Academy as well. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, this thank is you. the end of today's webinar. So uh, goodbye, everyone.